Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Welcome to Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Nathaniel here in Perth, Australia. We are profiling various people on the show, people who have a heart for the Lord, for the Kingdom of God. And we value those people who recommend other people to us. Pastor Stuart Tan has uh, strongly recommended Eric Schluter. And tonight with me in the studio, we have Eric. And you'll hear an amazing story. He's, he's coming from South Africa, but lives in Australia with his family here. He's got amazing testimony and uh, he's also a kingdom marketplace person and we'll talk about his business but also his desire to see the kingdom come with power in our mm. city welcome to the show thank Eric. you thank you for coming well you came with high recommendations from uh, pastor Stuart <laughs> yes. and i'm glad uh, we <laughs> had a conversation over the phone yes thank i you. always love it when people recommend others because you, you know you thank you you always get a, mm. a wonderful uh, uh, interview on a good mm. life story because we're all about life stories. Yeah, yeah. And yours began in South Africa, I take Mine began in South Africa, yeah. yeah. So, so your parents were in South Africa or they were German immigrants or their parents were? So German, um, South African, uh, but we go back about six generations when okay. the first German came through Southwest Africa Yeah, because at the time Southwest Africa was German. Okay. Was German occupied. Uh, no, it was Southwest Africa. Southwest Africa. German Southwest Africa. Mm -hmm. And then that one Schluter migrated into Cape Town. Yep. And then our family started there. So you were born in Cape Town? I was born in Cape Town, yes. Wow. Yeah. How, how many in your family? I'm the, well, I'm the only one. I'm the only sibling. Only I come from a generation of four only children, only sons. Okay. And I've got three girls. Oh, you broke the pattern. <laughs> so I broke the pattern. I'm sure your parents, if they had a girl, they would have tried again and again and again. Oh, uh, probably. <laughs> they wanted the name to carry on. Yeah. Well, these days, it's quite fashionable to keep your maiden name. Yeah, it is. So they can keep yeah. both. And our grandchildren, a couple of them carry my name as well. So Eric as well. Oh, yeah. so, double whammy. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. So Cape Town, what were your parents doing? Uh, my mother was a house mom. Mm -hmm. And my father was an engineer in the South African Navy okay. on ships, oh, on submarines to start with. So he was on ships and then he went to submarines and went back to ships again. Were you quite regimented at home? When he was there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> was he there a lot? Um, no, not often. Uh, he was at sea, especially towards the end of his career where he was at sea good 300 days a year. You know, oh, you know. that's hard. So it was just mum and I at home. Mm. You know. So you would have missed him. She did. And she you did. would have missed him. I, I did. I did. Uh, I mean, he was a, uh, if you think about the Second World War submarine type movies mm -hmm. and the chief engineers, big burly guys, big hands, yeah. rough as, that was like my father. But he had a heart of gold. Okay. You know, he did have a heart of gold. Wow. Uh, but he was tough. What was childhood like? Uh, childhood was a little bit lonely, mm -hmm. uh, being the only child. Um, I always strived to try and fit in, but yep. didn't. I always had to. I always had to make the effort to make yeah. friends. Uh, I do. Friends did not occur to me naturally. You had to initiate. I, I always had to initiate. I had to make sure I was on the spot yep. to be invited to something. Because if okay. I wasn't there, I was never. I, I was never given the phone call to say, "Do you want to come?" Mm. It's interesting. So yeah, it was it was good. Um, spent time with my mum, uh, quite a bit of time with my mum, um, and obviously once you get wheels, get a car, then luck of the world's open. You know? Yeah, and then you can go see lots of people. Did you play rugby or rugby? So yeah, I was rugby. Okay. I mean, rugby. Yeah. <laughs> you were made for rugby. I was made for rugby. Actually, I didn't. That, that would have made you that proud, didn't it? Yeah, he did. I mean, I didn't play for the top team. I wasn't, rugby was a sport that I wasn't really yeah. tremendously interested in playing, that is. Um, I much preferred uh, tuna fishing. Um, oh. So I used to do quite a bit of tuna fishing on the weekends. Off the boats? Off the boats, yeah. yeah. Um, you would, somebody would take you? Or? Yeah, yeah, so I'd crew on a boat. Okay. So you get a 
become a crew member when you go out on a boat. Okay. It was good fun. So let's uh, rewind back a little bit in your childhood years. Was your mum Christian? Were you going to church? Uh, my mum was Anglican and she used to go to church from time to time, uh, mm. but not a lot. Mm -hmm. She just dragged me a lot. Dragged me a lot. Literally. Literally. Yeah. Um, and so in my teenage years, no, nah, I never really went to church with mum. Mm -hmm. And my father was not interested in church at all. Yeah. Um, and only later on in life did I realise that my father was quite anti-church. Mm. You know? And so when about 14, I went to, uh, an uncle of mine got me a ticket to go on a Christian camp with the church that he went to. Yeah. A charismatic church, and um, I went on the camp, and, and, and that's where I discovered God, and that's where I discovered the Lord, and that's where I gave my heart to God. How did it happen? What was he preaching on? Do you remember? Or I was just camp, it was just yeah. a camp, okay. And they were calling up people who felt the heart of and it was about day three of a five day camp, yeah. And they're just calling up people and asking them, you know, if you want to come and give your heart to the Lord. And I just felt this overwhelming urge to go up and do it, give my heart. But the interesting thing though was, you know, you come home from a camp, you're pumped up, yep. and back to the flat line, and you you come home and you say, "Mom and Dad, guess what?" I go, "Oh, that's nice. Yeah, well done. Yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah. dog sweep the floor. Yeah, not not quite, but it's like, yeah. what are you supposed to do with this? You know, you could, yeah. I can now think yeah. they're going like, you would what, have celebrated. What, what are they supposed to be doing? What? Are, yeah. So yeah. I kind of, and, and I was lucky in that um, God had put people around me that were Christian as I was going through high school and that. And we shared stories and we shared things, but it was very a light touch, so to speak. It did, was only did a you begin a, a church attendance or not? I only when I started going to uni. Uh, what were you doing at uni? I was doing a Bachelor of Technology in Construction Management. Okay, so you didn't want to go on a ship? Or, uh, I did, but my dad spoke me out of it and said, <laughs> but it's, it's not a life. If you want to get married and have children, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, because the amount of time you spend at sea. Yeah. And um, and um, then, so I did construction. I actually wanted to be a pilot. That was my aim, to be a pilot. And I got as far as commercial pilot. Oh. But didn't have any more money to finish it. Yeah. It's quite expensive. Very expensive. So Not you, like, yeah, so where you, you do got your private and then you commercialize. I got a, a private commercial. I got 300 hours, you know. Mm -hmm. Next stage would have been quite... Our well, next stage was instrument rating and then sort of get onto twins and then from twins get onto jet jet props and um, and then potentially airline. I was 27 when I got my commercial pilot's license married mm -hmm. and it got to a point of Balance. how much do I want to impinge on my wife yeah. by all, sucking all this money out of our marriage into this. <laughs> um, not, a, not yeah. out of the bank account, but out of marriage. I like that. Well, it's out of what we share yeah. together, yeah. you know. And she would have understood, but the, the, the fact of the matter is I also realized that it's very heavily dependent on you maintaining your license on an annual basis. Yeah. Uh, medicals and hours. all the things and hours and all that kind of stuff. And all you need is one little hiccup and it's all gone. Yeah. You know, and... Um, By the way, do you know Andy Wood? Name rings the bell. He's a... Uh, instructor, he's uh, okay. yeah, here at Jonathan. Oh, okay. He's Did you fly yourself? No, no. Oh, okay. I've interviewed him. Ah, oh, okay. You've seen him not long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, and I've flown some, you know, bits and pieces since then, yeah. um, just for fun. Yeah. Uh, whenever I got a bit of money, then I'll walk down book a flight somewhere. No. Nice. But yeah, uh, it's, it was a nice part of life. So was the university in Cape Town as well? Cape Town, yeah. So you stayed at home. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so we had to do national service for two years. Oh, okay. how was that? Um, I was a bit apprehensive to start with, but having a father that was in the military, I kind of knew all the tricks. <laughs> and, um, and could you choose navy or military or no, whatever? They you, you you kind of put a preference down, and you depending on what. So I put down that I wanted to be a pilot. Yeah. Okay. Air so Force. I was drafted to the Air Force. Oh, you were. Yeah because of the potential of yep. being a pilot. But then I couldn't get in because my eyesight didn't make it. Okay. And nothing wrong with my eyesight, but my not, eyesight not didn't as, good as, they, as they wanted. Like. Yeah, they'll only select 30 out of 1,000 people, you yeah. know, whatever they interview and so on. And uh, I actually applied twice and went through the process twice just to, just to make sure that that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but yeah, the military service was just military service and go through it and be done with it. It was at the height of the apartheid, so you know, yeah. saw some interesting things and um, you know, I was in yeah. I mean, basically, I ended up being uh, airport security, mm -hmm. um, looking after the well-being of both the international airport and the military airport. They were one next to the other. Yep. And um, and so that was good. Uh, it was it was a fun time, but it was it's kind of you know you come out of school. I came out at nineteen. I missed a year. Came out at nineteen, and then twenty one. Now you go study. You know, yeah. which to me was the right thing because I'd lost. I'd got rid of the kind of childishness that you have when you leave school, yeah. and I'd grown up, yeah. and I knew what I wanted yeah, to do. Really, yeah. Well, really, the military yeah. helps you yeah. grow up, become a yeah. man, really. Yeah, and I mean. In my opinion, I think it it was a good thing. Hmm. You know, I think this is. How did you meet your wife? A uni blind date. Blind date. Who set mm -hmm. it up? Friend of mine. Oh. Friend of mine. I actually cancelled on them the first time. Wow. So they set up a barbecue and um, was <laughs> priority. So they set up a barbecue and um, at the last minute I got an offer to fly an aeroplane up country uh, for somebody. It wasn't yeah. paid, I just got the hours. And so I said, no, nah, can't come flying. Yeah. So I took my flight. Priorities. Yeah. And then the next weekend they organized the barbie again and then I met Jen. Yeah. Um, so, so these friends of yours, um, mm -hmm. were they a young couple? Were they, they were a young Christian couple, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, and so when you came back, uh, uh, hang on, let's go back to uni first. Yes. So at uni, you became more involved in Christian. I became not at uni itself, mm -hmm. but outside of uni, there was a couple of uni friends and some of my other friends yeah. from school that were going to a church, the same church that I went on the first Christian camp with. Okay. And so we so used this to go was there. A charismatic in the gospel kind yeah. of church. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're called St. James in Cape Town. It was, it was the maybe the only church in South Africa at the time during apartheid that was attacked by tourists. I wasn't there that night, that Sunday night. It I was, was attacked staying. by tourists? Terrorists. Terrorists. Yeah. Wow. A uh, number of people were killed and, mm. and so on. But yeah. Um, so we used to go Sunday evenings yep. and then go out for pizzas afterwards, nice. which was really great. Okay. You know, so you, you made a lot of friends there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And was your wife going to that church as no, well? No, she not, at all, not at all. But these friends of yours? So the friends of mine's wife yeah. worked with Jane, my wife. Jane. Jane. Janice. Jane. Janice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they worked together and yeah. they kept saying, you need to meet this guy. You need to meet this guy. You need to meet this guy. Okay. So they, they, they but they, I didn't out. know this was going on in the background. Yeah. I had no clue whatsoever. Yeah. No. Um, so yeah. you rocked up at this barbecue and they said, this yeah. is Janice. Yeah, and we sat down and we, we watched a movie, I think, on the video and, you know, with everybody and we chatted and um, I was attracted to her and, um, and um, she lived in a similar direction to what I was going. So he said naturally. one of them, naturally, okay. yeah. So that was all planned. I, I believe so. <laughs> and so I said to her, do you want me to give you a lift home? And we chatted in the car till very late at night and we agreed that we would go on a date and some a week or two later we went on a date. Four months later we were engaged and 18 months later we got married. Wow. Yeah. Did you have a lot of girlfriends before? No. no. I had friends but not girlfriends. Mm. Yeah. And she was a Christian as well? Uh, yes. Yes, she, she was a Catholic, uh, but her, Catholic and I say but. Um, she also had given a heart to God at school. Mm -hmm. um, so, although she went to the Catholic Church, she was, you know, committed Christian. And had you been baptized? Uh, by no, I had not been baptized. Not at that stage. I've been christened, but not baptized. Not at that baby. stage. Not at that stage. No. Mm -hmm. Later. Later. Okay. You want to hear about that? Uh, a bit later. <laughs> later. <laughs> later. You're right. Later. So you got married. Um, kids immediately or not? No. Uh, we, what was Janice doing? Was uh, Jan working? was a administrator for a travel agency, mm -hmm. and um, and so Jan is seven years younger than me, mm -hmm. and um, 
And so I had just finished uni and I just finished my commercial pilot's license. We'd been married about a year. And so my career was starting to take off. Yep. And, um, and um, so we waited about three years, maybe four, uh, before we had children. Mm -hmm. And then we had three children in four years. Three daughters. Three daughters. And that changed everything. I mean, that changed everything. <laughs> yeah, I just picture, very fast. just picture mum and me in a three bedroom house. Yeah. Okay. And suddenly I've got four women in the same house. It's yeah. just like, what's happening? I, um, I, I do the same. <laughs> I have four women in my house and a boy. So I've got okay. three daughters and a son. Son, we're going somewhere. <laughs> I did that yesterday morning. We walked 10 kilometers to the church. Ah, oh, very good. <laughs> Boys time together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then, what happened then? Uh, yeah, then I started my own business in South Africa. It didn't go well at all. Um, had to shut it down. What were you doing? I was building roof trusses mm -hmm. uh, for houses. Um, and the market was just not good. It was the wrong time. And, Basically, I had to just shut it down. So the, uh, normal, the normal procedure was just uh, the carpenters built it on site, like here. No, it was factory it was manufactured, trusses. factory manufactured trusses. Oh, they were. You send them out on a truck, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the normal practice was still trusses. Trusses, yeah. Okay. Uh, very seldom did you have carpenters build uh, roofs on site like they do here. Yeah. Okay. Which they call lofting roofs. They, they never used to loft roof. Very seldom did you loft a roof in South Africa. Everything was trusses quicker. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, you can, yeah. So you were a good pair those... of carpenters could put a roof up in a day and a half. So you were doing that in a, in a factory? You yeah. hired a. I had a big factory, yeah. yeah. And um, but cash flow was our problem. We were just hemmed in by cash flow. And yeah. You needed big cash flow. Oh, because you had to wait until people build a spade you and you have an outlay for the labor and the timber materials yeah and um what period was this what year approximately late 90s early 90s or early 90s yeah yeah because we immigrated to new zealand in 98 so let me work it backwards 98 two years before that yeah it's probably about 95 probably started the business about 93 mm -hmm. yeah and our youngest daughter was born sort of midway through owning the business. So. And uh, did you lose a lot or you lost the business? Uh, was there a lot of investment or mainly the business? Uh, mainly the business. We we tried to pay most people back. Yeah. Uh, some we couldn't. And, um, and I was just fortunate that we battled our way through. Um, you know, I mean, my, my life story is about faithfulness and I'll tell you yep. why I say that at the end. Um, and we got through, and then, then a friend of mine said to me, um, because you used to skipper boats in the tuna boats, yeah. um, we need a skipper to skipper a boat for Chevron Oil up in West Africa, mm -hmm. a smallish boat, not too big. And uh, I said, yeah, okay, I'll go and do that for a month. Well, I was there for 18 months, you know, okay. so month on, month off, month on, month off. And that was good. And then... Um, uh, we kind of realized that our girls were getting to school age yep. and we kind of realized that we didn't really want them to um, grow up uh, in the environment that we could see coming in yep. South Africa. And, um, and so we made some inquiries. Jan did most of the work. She made some inquiries and we looked at Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And we discovered that New Zealand was probably the closest to what we could could get, yep. and and what we could get on my qualifications and where yep. we were in terms of a family. Uh, so we made an application, and uh, we got a. No, how did it work? Yeah, we made an application. We got in. I got in first and um, started working in New Zealand, and then unfortunately, Jan's mother was murdered in Cape Town about a week before they were going to pack the container to bring it out to New Zealand. Um, and the New Zealand government was fantastic. They expedited her visa and within a week she was over in New Zealand with us. Wow. With me, you know. She was murdered in her home? In her home. In Cape Town, yeah. Just terrorists came through? Just burglars, basically. 
16, I think about 16, 14 and 15 year olds, three of them. They found them? They found them, yeah. yeah they found them in the end. And, um, and Jan had to go through a lot of forgiveness in that, in that space. How old was she? 50s, 60s? Her mother? Yeah. 60s. Yeah. It's harsh. Yeah, it is harsh. Um, and so, yeah, then life started in New Zealand. Where yeah. did you go in New Zealand? Auckland. Auckland. Yeah, so right. Auckland first. Big city. Yeah. Uh, sort of out in the country in a place called um, some greens, right? In Dairy Flat. So it's kind of, yeah, just on the fringes of the farms. Uh, it was beautiful and we really enjoyed it there. Um, you know. Did you get a contract to, to do some work or? Yeah, I got a contract to do some work. In? Uh, construction. Okay. And, Carpentry uh, or? Oh, no, I was project manager by then. Mm -hmm. So I was project manager. And it was almost a fresh start for you. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, career took a backward step by 10 years. Oh. You know, it's what happens. Well, in yeah. country New Zealand, you're, yeah. you're 40 years behind. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you were still clearly ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> but yes, uh, um, the. Um, yeah, the journey from there was the first time that I ever, uh, in New Zealand, was the first time that I ever um, experienced being made redundant oh. at the end of a project. Yeah. Because I'd never that had that it. before. Yeah. You know, I'd always gone from one project to the next and there was always work. And if I didn't like that company, I'd move to somewhere else and yeah. there was always work. And it was the first time I'd experienced that, like, project's finished, made redundant. It's like, hey. What next? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but yeah, something happened and, you know, work came along and uh, grew in that space, uh, got a number of good jobs and... Um, Faith-wise? Uh, hmm? Faith-wise? Faith-wise was still sort of average. I'd go to church from time to time and um, being in the construction industry and being a contractor, because that's the only yeah. way you could get work. Um, you, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid, yeah. literally. And so, um, I ended up spending a lot of, a lot of time at work, you know, getting to 10, the 12 hours, even more, more Saturdays, yeah. Sundays. Um, so faith took a dive, you know, and, was, and in mind, my, my whole aim and mission was just to keep us as a family alive. Yeah. Um, and then I started to realize that I wanted a life of significance. I wanted to make my life worth something. Yeah. And then started chasing the corporate dream and, and so on. So there you work even more, even harder. You know, when I look back now, you kind of just realize that um, at some stage, a tradesman was earning more per hour than what I was. Yeah. Simply, oh, that's common. That's simply common. because I was doing so many hours to try yeah. and, you know, get ahead. Yeah. And um, when I look back, I mean, it, it wasn't fair on the family. It really wasn't fair on the family. Um, and then we moved to the Bay of Plenty mm. uh, in Taranga. And, um, and there I was general manager of a company, general manager of the central North Island office. That was great. Also long hours because you have functions to go to. You have lots of things yeah. you need to do. Um, and it was the second time that Jen and I were able to work together. Uh, the first time was when I had the roof truss factory. Yeah. And that was the second time. And, um, and now Jen, now Jen and myself worked together again. And so third time, much better. Yeah. Other times it was, you know, it was difficult. We f I found it difficult and, and Jen found it difficult as well. Um, but yeah, um, so we worked together on the same company. Um, and then, and then my faith started we, by, by accident, I suppose. We learned of a church called City Life Church in, in Tarana. Mm -hmm. And we went there and it was a great church. We really loved it. We got really involved. So I got involved with, you know, extramural activities and Jan got involved. And like our life revolved around the church. And then my faith started to grow. And grow well. daughters yeah. had a buy-in as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so the, all, all the daughters had a buy-in, and um, that's where I was baptized. 
you both of you both of us Jan and I and two of my daughters awesome yeah. uh, but I was also baptized previously mm. when uh, our first daughter was born yeah and we were going to go through the baptism and we used to go to an Anglican church in uh, you know where we lived in South Africa and uh, when Natasha was born uh, the minister we was talking to so you go to these baptism classes as parents yeah a couple of them and he turned to me and said have you been baptized and I said no I haven't just christened yeah just christened so he said I'll spring for you too why don't why don't you get baptized again no no before oh so that you baptized when you were christened your daughter and I said, I'll think about it. And man, I went to sleep that night and God spoke to me. You've got to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so next day, I'll do it. Yeah. I'm there. It was amazing. It was absolutely, it was the first time I actually felt the Holy Spirit talk to me. Uh, so fast forward again to baptism in New Zealand. Um, I just felt that I needed to recommit because I had fresh knowledge. I had fresh commitment and I needed a recommitment and I needed to show my family that I was prepared to do this. Um, so we did that and then um, I was studying an MBA at the time. I was made redundant again and um, scratched around for some work and there was always work. I always had bits and pieces to do as you become handy with my hands so I can do just about anything. Yeah. And so that was good and then um, uh, what happened then? And then um, a job offer came up in Darwin. Oh, Australia. Yeah. Oh, history. And it was at the time of the Christchurch earthquakes. So yeah. I was really trying to get in because I believed I had the skills and talents to help in Christchurch. Oh, there would have been a lot of work. And, but I just couldn't find a spot. I just couldn't get it to stick. Uh, and then a position came up in Darwin, so we went up to Darwin. And at that point, it was kind of a little bit um, sad, I suppose, because our eldest daughter was going to do an OE as an au pair in England. Um, our middle daughter was just finishing school and wanting to go study in New Zealand. And so we just took our youngest daughter to Darwin. Oh. So at that point, the family split. Yeah, that's okay. tough. But it was tough. It was very tough. Um, uh, yeah, it was a very tough moment. Um, and so we spent time in Darwin. We got involved in Dream Builders Church in Darwin, again, quite heavily involved. Yeah. And that was fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Our oldest daughter came back from overseas and stayed with us in Darwin, mm -hmm. which was really great. The youngest daughter met stayed her husband and stayed in New Zealand and had children in New Zealand, which is great. We'll go and see them hopefully soon. Um, and then um, I got headhunted to a job here in Perth. Oh, okay. So, should I go? Shouldn't I? And then decided, okay, I'll come down. Again, climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah. Um, I'd been in the job just under two years and I was diagnosed with bowel cancer. Mm. And um, so basically, I went in for the colonoscopy, came out, we in the recovery room. Doctor, I saw this person walking towards me, and um, you know, looks like a doctor, smells like a doctor. It's a doctor, you know. Comes to me and he says, "Look, I don't have a lot of time. I've got an emergency upstairs. You have cancer. I'll see you on Monday." <laughs> and poof, gone. And that was the end of that. And and that was the first time that I kind of went in my life. I just went, "Okay, reality check. Mm -hmm. What now?" And I realized at the time that there were a number of prayers that I could have said at that point in time. And I could have said, why me? Please take it away. I don't want it. Um, you know, yeah, have mercy on me. Yeah. But the prayer that came out was, thank you for the opportunity of giving cancer. If I, I will take this on, but I want to know that I'm taking it on so somebody else doesn't suffer with it. I want to be a good patient mm. and I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Mm. Okay. Very... 
calm way of handling it. Yeah, same image in the glass orange juice. Um, and so, yeah, went into the cancer journey. And uh, I mean, there was some, you know, two and a half, three years of really chemo, tough radio. Work. So, uh, to start with chemo, uh, every day, tablets every day, morning and evening for two weeks, and then a break for two weeks, and then chemo, tablets again every morning and every evening for six weeks, yeah. and radiation treatment at the same time. No surgery. Yeah, surgery. As well. I've had five surgeries, yeah. Wow. And then a 12 week break, and then my first surgery, and then about every nine months thereafter, other complications started to happen. So I had more and more oh. surgeries. And, um, and so there were some God moments in that. There were some amazing God moments in that. Um, I can remember uh, I, they said to me, We've got to wait for a radiation machine to come free. So we've got to wait. So they've got five machines. Yeah. And they run 14 hours a day. Wow. And they've got to wait for somebody to drop off, finish their program before there's another spot. Yeah. How, and long, how long do you spend on a radiation machine? Half an hour? When you're actually in the machine, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah. Uh, so I used to go in. Uh, it used to be really good because I'd go in at about 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. And if you understand, you had a half an hour free parking. Yeah. And if everything worked right, I didn't have to pay for parking. <laughs> so this is quite recent. This is five years ago, oh. six years ago, yeah. And um, and so when I was speaking to the radiologist, I said to him, he said, look, we'll call you back in a week or two's time, give you the tattoos, mark it all up, do all the x-rays, do everything, because they've got to get it exactly on the right spot. Yeah. And I said to him, just have a chance. I just said to him, is there any chance we could do this any quicker than that? He said, hang on a moment. He went away and he came back and said, look, let's do the, let's do the x-rays and, the, and the, the tattoos now. The spots come available. Monday it's yours. It was wow. just like a Thursday. You know? Thanks, guy. It was just like, oh, you know, God moment. Definitely a God moment. And then after I had the first surgery um, where they removed a third of my bowel and some lymph nodes and all that sort of stuff, um, the painkillers were very strong. And, and, and all the other stuff that yeah, they were yeah, giving I me. I felt terrible. I felt worse probably mentally from the medicine yeah, than the actually the pain. Yeah. It was doing its job. It was keeping the pain at yeah. bay. But, I but you're not yourself. No, no. And I mean, you close your eyes, you're levitating off the bed and all kinds yeah. of things are happening. I listen there. And you grab the bed because you think you're going to fall off and stuff like that. And It's almost uh, like a bad dream. Yeah. Looking back at yeah. it, it's a nightmare. And so up until then, it was about night five. Up until then, you'd get an hour of sleep, and then the nurses are in changing yeah. something, and then you get a little half an hour of sleep, and they're in again changing something, doing something. Not their fault, it's just yeah, to happen, you know. But Hayden from Riverview texted me and said, how are you doing? And I texted him back and said, I'd just like some prayer that I could get at least two hours sleep. Mm. Without a break. A window. Yeah. So he said to me, he said, I'll get the pre term on it. Yeah. And so at that point, it was, must have been nine, ten o'clock at night. And at that point, I prayed as yeah. well. Please, God, I just want some sleep. Yeah. Without these dreams, without anything like this. And uh, I told the nurse, I said, look, this is what I want to try and do. She said, darkened the room and made everything as comfortable as she could for me yeah. and says, I'm not going to come and check you at uh, check your machines. I'm not going to change your machines. I'll just check and walk I'll in and walk out. I'll just check walking and walk out, but I'll have to do it two hours That's later. It. Perfect. Man, I close my eyes and the wall's white in front yeah. of the bed. That's darkened, but it's, the wall's yeah, white. And white. I close my eyes and you, you know it's dark when you close your eyes and there's glow of like this golden glow, like gold, like gold leaf on the wall. Open my eyes, it's white. Close my eyes, dark for a while, this glow comes back, just eases in. Three times. Yeah. And on the fourth time I close my eyes, it's, it's Eric, God, yeah, go to sleep. Oh, praise <laughs> God. And I slept for four hours. I slept yeah. through the changing on the machines, everything. Wow. So that was like the second time in my life that God... Definitely speaking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. 
And so, yeah, went through that, um, went through uh, various operations. One of the operations, you know, was not expecting that woke up in intensive care thinking that I had a, a heart attack or something. Um, but actually, unfortunately, the surgeons had punctured my bowel in doing the operation, didn't realize and bowel fluid had leaked into my abdomen and so they had oh. to pump it out and clean it. And so they put me in intensive care just to keep an eye on me over the next few days to make sure I wasn't getting any infections or anything. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of close calls, mm. a couple of close calls. In the process, so before my first operation, um, about just after finishing radiation, uh, the company I was working with just decided to make a third of the company redundant, of which I was Again. one of them. <laughs> which I was one of them. The Australian um, way. The Australian way. And, um, and it was really, that was a hard blow. That was a blow that was like, I'm gravely ill. I don't know if I'm going to be alive by the end of this year. Um, I now have forward. no job. Yeah. I'm in pain. Yeah. Um, and it got to a point where I just said, God, it's better for me to leave. So when you do this operation, it's better for me not to survive it because it was a 50-50 chance. And, um, and I was convinced this is what's going to happen. And when they, I got onto that table and the anesthetist and everybody was getting me sorted and getting everything plugged in and everything like that, a few seconds before they put the anesthetic drug in, I went, God, please forgive me. I want to live. I don't want to die. Yeah. And I carry, I've carried that for a long time. And only just the other day have I asked for forgiveness for having that thought. Mm. Um, so, yeah, went through all of that. Um, have, haven't really uh, been able to land any jobs. I've applied for about 80 or 90 of them. And then um, I've had work. I've had good work. Yeah. Um, pockets of it. Yeah. Um, but then Jane, my wife, who loves baking and cooking and all that sort of thing, she said, what about this business? Mm. And uh, I said, well, okay, MBA hat on, Dunk. let me do some analysis. And I started to do some analysis and it looked better and better and it looked better and better and it looked better and better. And I discussed with her some of the, the intricacies of what we were getting into yeah. and the fact that it's a very niche market that we're into. So it's bread flour and bread mixes and everything to do with home baking and bread. Oh, it's home baking. It's yeah. not yeah. Uh, commercial baking. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's oh. geared to the home baker. Yeah. Uh, but we can and we do supply small It's like all about bread and those like supplies. All about bread. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, oh, initially, I thought you were yeah. addressing it to the semi-commercial market. So uh, we, we are looking towards that yeah. um, if, with a whole different sort of offering. Yeah. But right now, it's about yeah. that. And so we, we, we prayed about it. And um, I said to Jane, because it got to a point where I wasn't working, Jane was working uh, at the hospital, she, at Fiat understanding. Uh, it's John of God. And it got to the point where we needed to make a decision. Do we take our savings and put it into this business? Yeah. Or scrap it, we go do something else. Yeah. Okay. So we, were at the, we, we went as far as we could without spending money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we got to this point. And so we said, okay, we'll pray about it and we'll see how we go and we'll see how we feel. This is on a Friday by Sunday. So Sunday night, Jan came to me and said, I, I get a really strong feeling we've got to go ahead. And I said to her, I'm sorry, I've got nothing. Yeah. You know? And so about the Tuesday, Wednesday, I was praying and um, I, just, I said, God, what do you want me to do? He says, I've shown you the path forward. Make the step. Yeah. Take the step. So then it was on. You know, then it was on. We were off. Not off, but we got started and we had to spend some money yep. and get websites up and running and hire, hire factories and do all the things that we had to do and get marketing sorted, um, get labeling, yep. logos. I'm pointing it on my back. Reason. Logos, yes. Good name. And so that was with our marketing team at Helium Marketing. Um, yeah. You know yeah. Helium Marketing? Of course. Yeah. So we sat down with them and they said, do we want to play a bit on the Christian name and, you know, flower yeah. and so on? And, and the, it's brilliant. We, we, we kind of just said, you go for it. And then they came back with three or four options and we picked this one. 
And they've done the website as well. Okay. They've done the website as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, we just trademarked everything as well. We well just, just got the trademark certificate now, so yeah. that's all good. Um, and Takes then about four months. Hmm? Takes about four months. Probably longer than that. Yeah, uh, it's probably taken about six. because we did, I mean, uh, uh, we had a four-month period of waiting for objections. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. I it, think it, it, took, it took a little bit longer than that by the time we got it all together. It wasn't cheap as well, um, but it was worth doing. Um, and slowly but surely, you know, well, not slowly. I mean, the business started with quite a big, quite a good hit. Yeah, um, and the, the trick was to keep the expenses down and get as maximum sales. So, so that you, was, you actually yeah. have a shop front, don't you? We have a shop front in our factory unit. Yeah, the one that um, you're leasing. I'm leasing from Pastor. Yeah, what's his name? It's not Stuart. Stuart. Oh, it's his. So I leased the factory from Stuart. Oh, it's his factory. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I was thinking Trevor, but I was. Yeah. Uh, um, and so yes, it's been it's been an interesting journey mm -hmm. going down that path. Uh, notwithstanding that, you know, I still struggle with being uncomfortable from operations and stuff on a day to day basis. Yeah. Um, and then last year, I had a um, uh, I got an infection in the in my right ear, uh, which affected the nerves in the back of my head, oh. um, and I was very ill for. A few da a day and then Jan, Pain, balance loss balance couldn't walk uh, and then Jan put me in the back of an ambulance and sent me off to hospital and I came back for and they they kind of got it sorted they got me walking again which yes. is the main thing and uh, I was back in the factory and on about the second or third day back in the factory I had a seizure oh. so woke up in the back of an ambulance again hey haven't I been here before about five days ago well, yeah, it feels the same yeah <laughs> And so, yeah, just from, look, from the ear infection, from the infection, yeah, yeah, from an infection of some sorts near yeah. the ear, yeah. Well, it's um, close to the yeah, neurons yeah, and yeah, brain. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's been an interesting journey, uh, and I've sped through a number of things, but it has been a very, very interesting journey. And your um, youngest daughter is still with you here, youngest and oldest. So, oh. oldest is in Dunsborough, yeah, youngest is here in Perth, and so. Aldous is getting married next year, but she has a grand year ready for us, which is fantastic. Little Miley. And in New Zealand, we've got Ezra and Selena. Um, and so the youngest is married, the middle is married, and the oldest is getting married next year. Um, but great son-in-laws across the board, so that, you know, couldn't, couldn't wish for better. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and in reality, it's actually Jan's business. Yes. And I know I support her. Yeah. Okay. You're the man behind it. Well, yeah, I just try and support her. It's her business, it's her idea. And you have yeah. employees as well. You have a not at the company. moment. Just the not two of moment. you. Just the two of us. So is it long days or uh, yeah, Jen gets in at about between five and six in the morning into the office. Yeah. Um, and leaves at four. We both leave at four. Um, and you operate on Saturdays as well, you have we to. have Saturdays to one o'clock. Yeah. Um, and we have workshops, so bread making workshops. Or oh, you teach people how to we do. teach people how to make bread. sourdough yeah. and basic bread, jam ah. Um But I also have. And do you sell equipment as well? Mixing, equipment, yeah, uh, yeah. We sell, we sell almost, bread machines. Yeah. We sell all the hand tools yeah. needed. Um, Forty, fifty different kinds of flours and bread mixes. Nice. Grains and seeds and various other things as well. Wow. And so we're going to progress into um, potentially desktop milling, yeah. where people can pick a grain, put it through the mill, and then go home with fresh flour and baked bread. Nice. Um, and so that's the intention. We're working towards that. And this past week, I've just been to see a stonemason down south uh, to start to cut our first six mill stones. Oh, um, for me, uh, so we can, I can build a, a stone wall with about 500 diameter. Nice. So build three of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can start doing it on a slightly bigger scale. Crush it yourself. Yeah. Um, awesome. In fact, just before coming here, I was cleaning grain for somebody else. So nice. I built a machine to clean Well, grain. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned to you just before the interview, I grew up mm. around mills. In fact, three kilometers from our house was a very popular mill mm. with stories of hundreds of years 
you know. Mm. Um, and it was on, it was a river mill. Yeah. And I think it's still operational today. Yeah. You can go there and you can do your flower. It's backed up by electrical mm. uh, motors as well. But it's, it's common practice still back mm. in Romania to, to mill your own flour. Okay. And uh, people still bake at home. On a weekly home. basis? Uh, no, no, no. They will, uh, I mean, flour lasts a yeah, long, last. long time. Honestly, like it to eat, it's, it's fine. Especially in winter in Romania, they, mm. they put it in these special bags mm. and it lasts six, eight months. Cool temperatures, no yeah. 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 Um, but they would, yeah, they would probably bake or they would probably meal every two, three months. Mm. And uh, then they would use it for all, you know, cakes and, you know, Back home, every third or fourth house will have a an oven, a clay oven. Okay. You know, uh, especially in the villages and towns. So it's common still. Mm -hmm. You know, people. It's it's not just for bread, but it's for cakes and walls and mm. beautiful patisserie. So we've only just well, uh, maybe Jan got it before I did, but and I mean she's just fantastic. She's just this trooper that keeps, you know working uh, so hard to 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 get the business to do what yeah. it needs to do. The first thing is we recognize that God is CEO. Yes. And everything passes through him. Yeah. Um, and we pray regularly. I wouldn't say we pray every day, but we pray regularly in the yeah. business. And, um, and we... Um, we try to so really interesting with the name risen yeah because quite a few people come into the business and go how did you discover the name risen <laughs> okay and we go it's actually pronounced risen and then you can see this they once they a confused look but they kind of look at you and go risen it's not risen no yeah, it's the risen door, the door has risen no we don't use that we say christ is risen yeah. is usually the comment we give back well wow. and We've never had anybody go, oh, you know, or anything like that. It's always been, oh, yeah, okay, got it. Yeah. You know? Um, and we, uh, in our shop, we have a container, a refrigerated container where we would keep our flour in. Yeah. And uh, when we have bread making courses, people write on it. And 50 to 70% of the messages on it are all, um, you know, God given messages from various groups that have come through. And of course, there's been Christian yeah. people in the groups. And so um, it's quite interesting because it's behind the counter. Yeah. So as I'm serving a customer, you'll you look at their eyes and you'll see them go to the messages on the, on the wall behind, behind me, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Unconsciously. Unconsciously, yeah. yeah it's not, on, it's it's not on purpose, you know. But we do spend a, a lot of time. We can spend a lot of time. There are some clients that come in, buy and go. Yeah. Uh, but then there's other clients that come in and all... all ask questions and well it's a conversion isn't it yeah, they have yeah. to convert to that yeah. lifestyle um and i mean like it's an art it's, it's, a, it's an art and a science. It's a, yeah yeah and uh it's a, i remember when we bought our first just small baking machine and we started mm. baking at home and you know my wife and i would eat half of the loaf there and then just with butter but then you start putting on the weight you know six months later you notice the muffin has popped up <laughs> exactly uh, because it's just tasty, you know. Yeah. We grew up with bread, so bread is still, still mm -hmm. central. It's interesting. I was interviewed once by a newspaper back in Romania, and they said, what's your favorite food? And I said, bread. Oh, well. And they said, why? And I said, because it tastes of life. You know, it's almost mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're alive, you eat bread. <laughs> you know, it's like it's the most basic um, food is that necessity that you need and mm. you know even jesus said man shall not live by bread alone you Correct. know it's like but that's also, the most essential one you know so I've, i wrote on the container that you know you said that he's the bread of life yeah. as well yeah you know? and and so the bread has that connection and it's not expensive which is yeah. the other thing it's not like you know that's when you bake a real fancy cake you yeah. could spend 20 bucks on it Easy. with all the things that you need to put in and decorate yeah. it and all that oh, a lot where more. bread can be you could bake $3, a loaf of bread $3. for three to five dollars. Yeah. You know, if he's giving to the sourdoughs, it's probably closer to five or six dollars. Yeah. And um, but it is a culture uh, in sourdough. It is a culture because you can yeah. grow the culture to make a yeah. sourdough. But uh, it is a 
Uh, and, and like I explained to a lady on the, on the weekend, she said, you know, I've just started making bread and I've discovered this recipe. And I said, you're opening up a funnel this yeah. way because now you're going to go, I've done this, and then you're going to get, and, and, and then it just grows and grows. Well, and the grows, beauty with this you know. is you get involved the kids, you get involved the yeah. family. You know, it's, there's nothing more beautiful than to have dinner with a freshly mm. baked Absolutely. hot bread. You know? it, almost, it almost is a better smell than a roast lamb in the oven. <laughs> I don't know which one's yeah. better. <laughs> oh, but I mean, the fresh or smell, or the, the, the smell of fresh bread. Yeah. And even the, the simple meals with fresh bread. Yeah. So a soup. Yeah. So you've got a, a homemade soup on the yeah. stove and you make a fresh loaf of bread and you put That's it on it. the table. It's a meal. A diff and, and it's communal yeah. because it's on the center of the table. Yeah. The soup pot's on the center of the table and it's served and it's cut and it's served. And it's communion. Yeah. It's sharing. Yeah. Um, one of the things we try and encourage people, we often say to people is, if you've got a stove and it's on and you're making one loaf of bread yeah. for three bucks, make another loaf and yeah. give it away. Yeah. And the other day someone came into the shop and said, you know what, I did exactly that. I hadn't spoken to my neighbor for so long and I just gave them this bread. And they I mean, were can you imagine over... giving hot bread to somebody? It's yeah. like they can't refuse it. Yeah. 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 And... It's, as I said, it's not an expensive gift, but it's got this special meaning yeah. that goes with it. Oh, it's unforgettable. Yeah. It'll mark. It will scar yeah. people for life. <laughs> exactly. It's so, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting journey that we're on. And, um, and I say we because it is my wife and myself. Yeah. Um, I do some work with Alcoa Mining. So yeah. I've got back into project management. So right. I'm supporting the family, my wife, myself, and the business because we're still putting some money into it. Um, by doing some project management work. Well, and yeah. so I've gone from being a general manager of 50 to 80 project managers to a project manager managing a couple of small projects, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah. Um, well, the principles are still the same. Yeah. It's, but it's more fun. It, it is more fun. Um, and, and less money, which sometimes is good. <laughs> well, yeah, well... If you want to talk a bit about the money side, you know, as I was striving to um, progress in the corporate world, yes. yes, the money was getting better. But you I found that you were, we, in at one stage, we had a million dollars in mortgage. Yeah. I was thinking, and at the time, it was like a 11% interest rate or something. It was like $6,000 a month or something. You know, Two thirds of my salary went into the mortgage. Yeah. And we weren't living that well. No. For what I was earning. Yeah. And so when I got the cancer, we had a, a small property, a small holding avocado pear orchard in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, my wife and myself made a decision that I, we will sell it mm -hmm. because we weren't sure of where I was going to be yeah. within a year. And uh, so we sold it. We got rid of it. We, we, we only got out of it uh, what we put in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we bought it, uh, and on the day we settled, the Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. The oh. GFC started. Yeah. So we went from a nine hundred thousand dollar property to five hundred thousand. <laughs> you know, and and so the lesson for people, I suppose, is in today's world is, you know, what I say sometimes is when people say, oh, you know, managing finance and that sort of thing. If you can't pay your credit card off immediately, you're in trouble. Yeah. That's the first sign of yeah. something's wrong. <laughs> you know? um, and if you've got all these investment properties and they're all mortgaged 100% or close to 100% because you leave it off your family home, I don't know if that's the right answer. Yeah. You know? um, so what ended up happening, we sold that home, uh, went through the cancer treatment, um, did some odd jobs, and you know we carried a fairly large credit card bill and a few other loans that we had. And through that period of time and the odd jobs, I managed to wipe it. Yeah. So as we sit here today, no debt. Praise God. But we rent a house, but no debt. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's an un, it's an unbelievable feeling. Yeah. You know, no it's, it's, and I mean, God knows our heart, and He knows that um, we would like to have our own house again and you at will. some point. Um, and so you know, we we that's what we'd like. We've given it to God, and we're yeah. leaving it there. And every now and again, I'll look around, pull the curtain back and say, have you done anything about it yet? No. Okay. We'll leave it there. <laughs> What's next for you? 
Ooh. Next. Get the mill up and running. Is, then, is where I'm at at this point. Ministry wise. Well, we, what I wanted to say was we. I have only just discovered that we are ministering in the business. Yeah. Because I saw it as a business. It's a business, and we spend a lot of time with our customers. But only oh, two or three months ago, and I've got goosebumps. Only two or three months ago, I was praying to God. I said, God, what do you want me to do? Yeah. You know, I've got a Alcoa mining. I'm doing this project management. I'm helping Jan with this business, and we're busy, and it's great, and yeah, life's good. Yeah. But I feel if there's something missing, and he just said to me, "Your ministry is the business." That's right. Just keep doing it. That's what I've yeah. asked you to do. Just keep doing it. Yeah. And so when people say, how's the business going? Then I, I, you tell them how the ministry is. I ask which, which part of the business. Yeah. Which part? If you want to know about the ministry, I'd say we're doing okay. We're doing pretty good. Yeah. If you want to know how the business is going, it's doing okay. We almost did break even. Two years is kind of the right number. Oh, it's you know? perfect. And, um, and so... One of the things I suppose we need to be careful about in growth in the business is potentially being too greedy and growing it to an extent where we can't have that personal relationship with most of our customers. Yeah. You know, so people say, go into Coles, go into Woolies, do no. this, do that, you know. And they kind of go, there's something special about what we yeah. do with our customers. No, this is boutique, you know? this is gourmet, this mm -hmm. is... It's different, and um, I think the personal connection is very important to the mm. customer. And look, uh, connecting with the customer is first to get that conversion, mm. and after that is just maintaining that relationship. Yeah. So the time and effort is to get them across the line. Mm. After that, they're loyal. You know. I mean, we had a customer, an older lady, who's Finnish from Finland, yeah, and she'd been in Finland eighteen yes. months, yeah, until about five weeks ago. And she came back because she's got a daughter here and a son there. Yeah. And um, so she came in to get some. She said, thank goodness I found you. I can get some proper flour. Yeah. So what do you mean proper flour? Can't you get the flour? And she's not in Australia. In Finland we can, but we yeah. can't get it here. Yeah. The rise and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so I got talking to her and I said, how's Finland feeling about the whole Russian thing going yeah. on at the moment? And she said, we're praying. Oh, so, praise God. So I went, what do you mean you're praying? An hour latest conversation, and I'll give you the shortened version. The hour later in conversation is apparently in Finland in the old days to give messages from one one family to the next, especially up in the north. Yeah, they'd light a fire on the hill, mm -hmm. and then the other family could see it. Yeah, and then they'd light a fire as a warning, and then they'd light a fire. She said, "But today we're not lighting fires; we light candles." Okay. And today, I mean, as in five weeks ago yes. when she was in Finland, and they. Um, they're praying round the clock. Yeah. Their candle stays lit all the time. So if that one burns down, they put another one on. Yeah. And they just keep going because they're praying for their country. They're praying yeah. for the survival of their country. And she said they are playing round the clock at the moment. Wow. And she joins in via um, Zoom. Zoom or FaceTime yeah. or something like that. Beautiful. But it's just, I would not have known that if I hadn't asked the question. That's right. Beautiful, you know, and in in all of this in my life, mm. the various churches that I've been to yeah. have supported me, and you know I go to men's prayer group on Wednesday mornings at Riverview. Those guys are fantastic; they yeah. have absolutely supported me through this. My wife has been the most amazing wife you can be through the cancer. I'd wake up in the morning in hospital somewhere between. When I had the, the operations, yeah. somewhere between say five thirty six o'clock, my wife's sitting in the chair opposite me reading a magazine. Yeah. I don't know what time she got in there, but she was waiting for me to wake up so she can help me have a shower yeah. or, and whatever you know, before she goes to work. Yeah, every morning. Wow. It's just you know, if you want to understand love in a family, that's that's what it's about. Yeah. You know, um, and it's just it's just amazing. So getting back to what I said earlier about faithfulness. God has been so, had so much faithfulness in what he said he was going to do and how it's affected my life. Yeah. There's never been a moment but I've, when I've felt he's not there. Mm. 
Mm. There's never been a moment where we've not had enough money for the essentials. Yeah. We've never not had a roof over our head. And there's always been an opportunity to look to the future yep. through all of that journey. Mm. And only now when I reflect back can I see, man, he's been so faithful. It's really, and you kind of go, why me? I've been, I'm a sinner. Yeah. Like we're all sinners. I am a sinner. I mean, I muck things up on yeah. a fairly regular basis, you know. But he's just so faithful, just guiding hand, mm. guiding hand every time. Beautiful. Which is great. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Only a pleasure. What a beautiful story. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting when we start uh, chatting at the beginning, you don't think of... Um, where the story will lead and it will end and where it is going. But the beauty is that in every single one of us, God has deposited something amazing. And the life journey that each of, each one of us has um, is very interesting and deep. And God is doing something. He's done a lot of things in Eric's life and I'm sure he's done a lot in your life. And I just pray that his testimony will encourage you, uplift you to carry on the good work. And just remember, as Eric said, the business or the marketplace that you're in, that's your ministry. And that's a good start to uh, begin sharing the gospel with those people around you. May the Lord bless you. And we we'll look forward to seeing you next time at Kingdom Stories from Nananda. I'm Nathaniel Pastia. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, Every story is worth sharing, including yours.